A little girl was praying the Lord's Prayer on Christmas and said, Lord, forgive us our Christmases. We need the Lord to forgive us our Christmases when we forget what it's really about. We need to stop forming our opinion off what everybody else says. We need to look in the Word of God and find out what... Is there anybody agree with that? How many of you believe that book is the truth of God tonight? Somebody shout it! I don't care what these other charlatan preachers say. They twist and pervert the truth of the Word of God. They go looking everywhere else to prove it, but they can't prove it by the Word of God. Some of you are so ignorant of the Word of God and so willing to accept anything that comes down the pipe that the moment someone says, Jesus or Bishop or priest or anything, you go, oh, it must be okay. No. You try the spirits. You search the scriptures. <laughs> Lord, the spirit of Christmas and the wonder of the season is filling our hearts and filling the air here uh, in the church. And we pray your blessings upon the service tonight. Are you people idiots? What's Christmas about, preacher? Do you know what the Bible says about the Christmas tree? Very few know why we do the things that we do, or where our customs come from. We were born into a world full of customs. The real origin of Christmas goes back to ancient Babylon. The name Nimrod is Hebrew and derives from Marad, meaning he rebelled. December 25th was the birthday of Nimrod. They celebrated this famous birthday over most of the known world for centuries before the birth of Jesus. December 25th was highly honored and recognized by Nimrod supporters. Many centuries later, it was Christianized as being the birthday of Jesus Christ. Nimrod was the founder of a religious system that began in ancient Babylon and has always opposed God. The Bible states that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord and began to be mighty in the earth. Biblical traditions associating Nimrod with the Tower of Babel led to his reputation as a king who was rebellious against God. This heaven-defying group of people wanted one government to rule the world and one religion to sway the hearts of mankind. This was their attempt to defy God and his authority, and the ringleader of this scheme was Nimrod. Nimrod had a plan to weld together and strengthen this evil religious system, and so he married his own mother, who was Semiramis. She was the first deified queen of Babylon, and Nimrod was the first deified king. Semiramis was known to be as wicked as her son, Nimrod. Incest was used here as a basis to unite this newly false religious system. If you got to thinking about that tonight, he'd crank your tractor. This false system had a sacrificial plan just as God had a plan of sacrifice. But pagan worship required the offering of human beings, which was often the sons and daughters of the worshippers. A counterfeit holy day was instituted in honor of the sun god, Sunday. After Nimrod's death, his so-called mother-wife, Semiramis, propagated the doctrine of the survival of Nimrod as a spirit being. She claimed the full-grown evergreen tree sprang overnight from a dead tree stump, which symbolized the springing forth unto new life of the dead Nimrod. On each anniversary of his birth, she claimed Nimrod would visit the evergreen tree and leave gifts upon it. Traditionally, a Yule log was burned in the fireplace on Christmas Eve, and during the night, as the log's embers died, there appeared in the room, as if by magic, a Christmas tree surrounded by gifts. The Yule log represented the sun god Nimrod, and the Christmas tree represented himself, resurrected as his own son Tammuz. So our Christmas tree and our Yule log have tremendous meaning. The Yule log is the dead Nimrod, human ruler of ancient Babylon, who was eventually deified as the sun incarnate, and hence a god. The Christmas tree is the mystical Tammuz, the slain god come to life again. This is the true origin of the Christmas character we all know as Santa Claus, who brings gifts underneath the evergreen tree every year on December 25th, which is very similar to the ruler Nimrod and his son Tammuz. And I was shocked and amazed that the Christians, who this week defended lying to their children and wanting, giving, wanted to give glory to a fat man in a red suit, for something they had done because of the goodness of God. 
Think about that. They're taking glory that belongs to God because he gave you everything. And then of what he gave you, you gave to your children. You're taking that glory that belongs to God and you're saying, hey, let's give it to this little fat jelly guy in a red suit. And I was even further shocked by a pastor, quote unquote, who defended this lie and said that the children's dreams shouldn't be harmed. Uh, I thought the Bible talks about filthy dreamers. Dreams aren't a good thing in the Bible, in New Testament context. There were times in the Old Testament God used them, but New Testament context is a little different. When you have, he's not talking about dreams you have at night when you're asleep. He's talking about dreams like imaginations. As I already said, the Bible says casting down imaginations. You get rid of those things. And I heard excuses about the magic of the season. I heard excuses about not destroying the children's imagination. It's good for them to exercise their imagination. Uh, not about things that are lies and things that aren't the truth. Not about things that steal the glory from God. I quoted to you 2 Corinthians 10, 5 that says, casting down imaginations. But I want you to understand that I believe Santa is nothing more than a replacement God. He's a replacement for God and a replacement God. I believe Santa steals all the attributes of God and claims them for himself. Nimrod, the sun god reborn. December 25th was the birthday of Nimrod, and here we have the real origin of the Christmas tree. So much of this world is backwards and inverted. Who is responsible for all of this? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole earth. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from the heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. It's time we face the facts. This world is deceived, just as God prophesied it would be. It seems like this story has been told throughout our history with many different players and many different associated religions. Nimrod's church had its beginning at Babylon with the construction of the Tower of Babel on the plain of Shinar by the river Euphrates many generations after the deluge. At the time of the construction of Babylon, at the Tower of Babel, mankind had multiplied and spoken one language. Cush, who was the son of Ham and grandson of Noah, helped to plan with his son Nimrod, a blueprint by which to rule the world of humanity through a wicked counterfeit religion. Nimrod was the originator of sun worship and founder of Babylon. A Bible translation says, Nimrod became a mighty man of sin, a murderer of innocent men, and a rebel before the Lord. The beginning of Nimrod's plan had its origin at Babel, which was later known as Babylon. This city of Babylon, with the tower whose top may reach unto heaven, was built by Nimrod. They called the Tower of Babel the Gate to Heaven. But God called it Babel Confusion, for their God confused the language of the people, which forced them to scatter. Philip, I read that used to. I'm still looking for all the evidence. The church is not to be bathed in the opinion of man. The church is to be bathed in the Word of God. If you're still with me, somebody type amen this morning. If you're still with me, somebody hit a thumbs up this morning. Now, if you're still with me, somebody let me see some hearts flying this morning. I feel God in this place today. I didn't, this one ain't my list either, people. 
picks up his offering left under the green tree. <laughs> yeah, go look in your Bible and find out where they gave offerings to Baal. I feel God in this place. And today. all the false gods, they had groves and they left their offerings and their gifts under the every green tree, the Bible says. So this evil spirit enters your house, reaches under your bale bush, and grabs a hold of his offering. But all your doors are locked. How's that possible? Unless he's like God. Where does Santa Claus live? North Pole. The North Pole. So he's, if you had to pick a cardinal direction, north, south, east, or west, where is he at? North. north. Hmm. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. The Bible says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So he says, You're come unto the place where God is, unto the city of the living God, and it is the Mount Zion. Well, the question is, where is that at? Take your Bibles, turn to Proverbs, I mean, Psalm chapter 48. Psalm chapter 48. And listen to verse 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 3. Listen, we read verse 14. It's Satan saying, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. But go back to verse 13. For thou hast said, he's talking about Lucifer. This is what Lucifer said in his heart. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Santa is from the north. God is from the north. So we have already got two attributes of God that they've given to Santa. Take your Bible, turn me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. Did you know that Santa Claus is omniscient? He's all-knowing. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you're asleep. How does he know all this? How does he know which houses all over the world has children unless he's all-knowing? Omniscient. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Omniscience is a character of God, but they've given it to Santa Claus. Just the way Lucifer said, I am going to ascend above God and I'm going to be like God. I believe Santa has done the same thing. He wants to take a place for himself that is God's and God's alone. And I know some of you are probably thinking, Brother Butch, are you saying we're teaching our children to honor the devil by honoring Satan? Yes, I am. And you are. And the most likely reason is your ignorance of the word of God and your ignorance of the attributes of God that have been given to Santa. Maybe... If you stop listening to them charlatan preachers who tell you it's okay for your children to have that and got into the word of God, opened the word of God, and saw all the attributes of God that Satan has stolen. I'm sorry, Santa has stolen. By the way, I think that wasn't a slip. I believe they're one and the same. If you get into the word of God and see all the attributes, you'd say, you know, this can't be an accident. Surely a bunch of godless people 
who sat around and thought up all the ideas about Santa couldn't have possibly taken all the attributes of God, I'm talking minuscule things you find in the Bible, and made those attributes to Santa. It had to be someone who knew the Word of God, who understood the Word of God, and understood the things in the Bible that would take all those attributes and give them to Santa. Who was it? Satan and his ministers. You see, God does not allow his glory to be given to someone else. Let me say it again. God does not allow his glory to be given to someone else. That is why there's no such thing as good pride in the Bible. I don't care. I listen, I have a, a guy who used to be a friend who likes to say how there's good pride. I don't care what that pride preacher in Michigan says. He's wrong because my King James Bible never has a good use of pride. It's always bad. You know why? Because pride is taking glory that belongs to God and giving it to someone else. That's why the Bible says, in all thy ways acknowledge him. In Isaiah chapter 42, look at verse number 8. This is God speaking. He says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. He says that his glory will not be given to another. And he also says that his praise... Neither my praise, so he says, my praise cannot be given. Get what it says there, to graven images. We're going to chase a little rabbit trail here for just a second. You see that statement? Neither my praise to graven images. How many of you out there are setting up graven images called manger scenes or nativity scenes or creches this time of year, and you're saying, oh, it's baby Jesus in a manger. God says he will not give his praise to a graven image. Oh, you would never have a statue of Joseph in this corner and a statue of Mary in this corner, but come once a year, you're running right back to the Catholic Church and you put your little statue of Jesus in the middle of your house. It's still a graven image, people. Stop being stupid. You say, you're not nice. What am I supposed to be? I'm coming to you because you know the truth, but you don't want to dwell in it. And no lie is of the truth. You can't lie and say, well, that's not a graven image. It is a graven image. No, they'll say the graven images are acceptable this time of year. But they'd never have those statues of Jesus or Mary or Joseph any other time. Why are we so ignorant of what God says? Simple truth is we don't spend the time in his word. We need to. Because a manger scene is a graven image. Now let's get back to Satan claws. And the claws is a way for Satan to get his claws into your children. And proof can be found. And get this. What do you, anybody remember? Now, my wife's here. We talked about this a little bit this morning. But some of you all think out there, what is the name that Santa Claus had when he was younger before he became Santa Claus? What's his other real name? Chris Kringle. Some of you out there may have heard that. Did you know Chris Kringle is a play on the Dutch word Christ kind? Chris kind? Christ kind? Chris Kringle? And you know what it literally means? The Christ child. Oh, no. Tell the old St. Nick, old Chris Kringle, he can't be a replacement for God. Then why do they call him the Christ child? And that's why they call it Xmas, because you don't know who it is that you are worshiping. Even if, let's say even if St. Nicholas, who was a Catholic, so he wasn't Christian, let's say he was a Christian. Still, what would that have to do with the birth of Jesus? which could never have happened in December. In Isaiah chapter 42, look at verse number 8. This is God speaking. He says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. He says that his glory will not be given to another. And he also says that his praise... Neither my praise, so he says, my praise cannot be given. Get what it says there, to graven images. 
We're going to chase a little rabbit trail here for just a second. You see that statement? Neither my praise to graven images. How many of you out there are setting up graven images called manger scenes or nativity scenes or creches this time of year, and you're saying, oh, it's baby Jesus in a manger. God says he will not give his praise to a graven image. Oh, you would never have a statue of Joseph in this corner and a statue of Mary in this corner, but come once a year, you're running right back to the Catholic Church, and you put your little statue of Jesus in the middle of your house. It's still a graven image, people. Stop being stupid. You say, you're not nice. What am I supposed to be? I'm coming to you because you know the truth, but you don't want to dwell in it. And no lie is of the truth. You can't lie and say, well, that's not a graven image. It is a graven image. In Isaiah chapter 42, look at verse number 8. It says, God speaking, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. He says that his glory will not be given to another. And he also says that his praise, neither my praise, so he says my praise cannot be given, get what it says there, to graven images. We're going to chase a little rabbit trail here for just a second. You see that statement? Neither my praise to graven images. How many of you out there are setting up graven images called manger scenes or nativity scenes or creches? This time of year, and you're saying, oh, it's baby Jesus in a manger. God says he will not give his praise to a graven image. Oh, you would never have a statue of Joseph in this corner and a statue of Mary in this corner, but come once a year, you're running right back to the Catholic Church, and you put your little statue of Jesus in the middle of your house. It's still a graven image, people. Stop being stupid. You say, you're not nice. What am I supposed to be? I'm coming to you because you know the truth, but you don't want to dwell in it. And no lie is of the truth. You can't lie and say, well, that's not a graven image. It is a graven image. Ah, I think it's a little stolen glory. What do you think? There's a lot of you Christians out there who you get awful upset about some guy faking to be a military guy, but you won't, fake, you won't get upset about a guy faking to be your God. You know what else he's doing that's a lot like God? He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Uh, who's the one really keeping the list and going to judge people from it? Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I saw, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You know what God did? He looked at that book and said, I'm going to check out your works to see if you've been naughty or nice. Now, we know you don't get into the book of life or you don't stay in the book of life if you're not saved. I happen to believe that I can prove biblically that your name was written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. Here's another one for you. Guess what Santa does for all the children? You come sit on his lap and tell him what you want so he can give you a what? A gift. He gives gifts to all the children. But the truth is that even if they're bad, they get gifts. But the question is, where do gifts come from? James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is come from above and come down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable this, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift comes from God. But yet we tell our children, it's from Santa Claus. I heard about this lady who says, even to this day, her adult children write from Santa on every gift. Well, she's a loon, and her children are too. As an adult, gifts you give to each other, you'd still write from Santa? 
Well, if your God is Satan, I can understand why you'd write Santa on it. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. You know what you're taught to do with Santa? You're taught to reverence him, to fear him. Oh, well, I gotta be afraid of Santa. I gotta have reverence for Santa. I gotta be, I gotta better be good because I don't wanna be bad because I don't wanna, you know, there are mothers this time of year. And you know what they'll do to try to get their children to listen? Their children won't be listening. They'll go to run away. No, you know what they'll say? Santa's watching you. They're teaching them a reverence, a reverential fear for Santa. And Santa accepts it. But that's exactly what children are supposed to be taught about God. Look at me in Psalm 34. Psalm chapter 34. And verse number 18. Psalm chapter 34. And verse number 18. I'm sorry, 34 verse 11. The Bible says, Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, parents today, some of you Christians out there are teaching your children to reverence and fear Santa Claus when the Bible says you're supposed to teach them to reverence and fear God. You know what else Santa requires? Take your Bibles turn to Romans chapter 14. Santa requires everyone to give an account of themselves to him. Think of some of the cartoons you've seen. Think of when, when, when you go sit on Santa's lap at the mall, guess what he asked you? Have you been good or bad? You got to give an account of yourself to Santa. Romans 14, chapter 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. God's the one who requires us to give an account, but so does Santa. You got to give an account of yourself. Have you been bad or good? You better be good for goodness sake. You know what else he is? He's the judge of right and wrong, isn't he? Where's the standard that he has for us? That Santa has for us? He knows if you've been bad or good, but by what standard? Who makes that standard? Where's it at? Have you ever seen his written standard? You know what we teach our children to do? To believe in him. Oh, you've got to believe in Santa. You've got to put your faith in Santa. Santa does take requests. He does accept prayers, if you will. Some of you say, oh, I don't believe that. Let me ask you something. Have you ever played Santa Claus? I have. And my wife can tell you that one time I did in my stupidity and my ignorance of the truth, had a young teenage girl come sit on my lap and break down in tears and beg me as Santa Claus that all she wanted for Christmas. Yes, I don't say that word. I believe it's blasphemy to God. All she wants for that mass was for me. Santa Claus to bring her dead friend back. You don't think he's not a replacement God? He is. She just wanted to cry on my lap and tell me all about her dead friend and ask if there was any way for the holiday if I could bring back her friend. Even though she was old enough to know Santa wasn't real. She was old enough to know I wasn't the real Santa even if he was real. But she still brought her requests and her petitions to me. Playing that jolly old evil spirit. Yeah, I played an evil spirit. There comes a time in most people's lives, except for these idiots who are adults and still write Santa on every gift. There comes a time in everyone's life when they wake up or they hear and find out that Santa's not real. And you know what people tell them to do? <gasps> Keep Santa alive in the children's hearts. You ever heard that? Oh, don't kill him in the little children's Listen, just because you know, don't tell Johnny. Don't tell your little brother the truth. Keep Santa alive in his heart. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Look at the second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. They say, keep Santa alive in your heart. But guess who it is that's actually alive in you and dwells in you? Second Corinthians six sixteen. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. But he's alive in the children's hearts. Who should be alive in the children's hearts? Well, with Santa, it's magic. Uh, yeah, you're right. It is magic. Satanism, witchcraft. You see, I find it amazing that someone who claims to be a Christian can so willfully be deceitful to their children. You're not just lying. You're willfully deceiving your children. You're taking and not just tell, not wanting them to know something. You're willfully teaching them something that you know is a lie. You're deceiving your children. You're acting just like the devil. They willfully lie to them and tell them that the thing that God has blessed their family with and that mom and dad gave them, well, they're all truly from the fake fat God, Santa. The fake fat God wannabe. You see, even before my family and I gave up the celebration of the Christ Mass. By the way, yes, you've heard me say it several times. Christ Mass. It is Catholic and from the great whore of Babylon. And you're commanded to come out from it. You should have nothing to do with it. Every time, next time I hear, if I ever hear someone say to me, keep Christ in Christ Mass. I'm going to say, keep Mass in Christ Mass. I'm just going to say back to him. Because you sure want to keep Christ in something he's never been a part of. Christ has never been a part of the Catholic Mass, you loons. He's not a part of it. He wants nothing to do with it. There is no Christ Mass. That is taking your Savior and putting him to an open shame by putting him to death again. The Bible forbids it. But you say, hey, let's all be a part of it. Once a year, you go running back to the whore of Babylon, right under her wings, hiding right under her every green tree, offering your sacrifices to your pagan, fat, little, red-dressed God. You're guilty of idolatry, even if you don't know it. How dare you, when your older child finds the truth, you tell them, you keep lying to your sister, you keep lying to your brother, don't you tell all your cousins the truth. How dare we command our children to lie? I have a question. Who made you God and authorized you to tell someone else it's okay to tell a lie? Who made you God? Now, not only is your Santa stealing God's attributes, so are you. You're telling me it's okay to lie when God says it's not. Who gave you the right to authorize your children and other people to lie? Look at me in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 9. The Bible says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Uh, maybe you're so willing to lie and get other people to lie for you and ask people to lie because you haven't put off the old man. Just a question. Why, if you claim to be a Christian, are you so willing to act like the father of lies? John 8, 44. We don't need to turn there again. Satan is the father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning. And you know what Jesus said about those people in that statement? He said, you're of your father, the devil. Is that why you do the lie? Is that why you keep the lie alive? Now, some of you are going to be mad at me, but am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's Bible verse. Yes, I will be some of your enemy after this because I told you the truth. When we, other keep, when we command others to keep alive a lie that we have made, we are being Satan-like, not Christ-like. Why don't you repent of your lies? Why don't you tell your children the truth? And if you want to celebrate the Mass, that's between you and God. 
I can't. I won't. That's between you and God. I think you're wrong. But at least let your children know the truth about where those things came from, that you and daddy worked hard to gain those things for them. And because God has blessed you, you've been able to pass it on to them. Don't give glory to some fat man that looks like and acts like and speaks like God who didn't do a thing except in your children's imaginations. You know what you're doing? You're doing more harm than good. Because someday, your children may wonder, if that old omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God Santa was a fake and a phony and my parents lied about him, how about the one in the Bible? He's got all the same attributes. Is that just a lie too? Now, some of you may say, oh, oh, Brother Butch, my parent, you know, my children are never going to believe that one's a lie. <clears throat> oh, really? Heard a preacher tell a story of how, what made him change, because he did celebrate the Christ Mass. And he did teach his children about Santa Claus. And he was out witnessing. And one night, as he was at a gas station, he stopped and walked up to a man and said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? He said, what do you want to talk to me about? He says, I want to tell you about God. He goes, stop. He said, I don't want to hear nothing about your God. He said, why? He says, what's wrong? He says, look, my Christian parents who brought me up in church lied to me about Santa who had all the attributes of God, and now you're going to tell me this God's real? Get out of my face. You don't think it can happen? He knew his parents were liars, so why should he believe them about God? Maybe your children will think that he's just a fairy tale, just like Santa. And maybe he's just a fairy tale that needs to be kept alive in the dreams and the hearts of the children. By the way, you know what the Bible says? You'll give account of every idle word that you tell your children about Santa Claus, or should I say Satan Claus. You may think you're doing okay. And you may hear charlatan preachers tell you it's okay. And you may scold other people for wanting to tell your children the truth, even if they didn't do it willingly, if they did it by accident. Shame on you. Say you're trying to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord when you're willfully lying to them. When you bold-faced lie to your children, but you say, oh, I'm trying to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As you lie to them, as you boldly deceive them, how dare you fake phony preachers out there tell others it's okay to keep these lies alive. You might call them dreams or lies. How dare you try to set up our standard of telling the lie to our children. You try to set up that standard and try to make everyone else keep your standard lying. Well, listen up. I know you don't believe in Santa Claus, but I do. So don't you dare tell my children the truth. You say, well, Brother Butch, that's awful harsh. There's nothing wrong with it. It's all good fun. It's all good, clean stuff. You know, it's all just magical and stuff. You know, there's nothing to worry about. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever found out where magic comes from? Every time anything about sorcery, magic, or magicians come up in the Bible, it's always evil and wicked. Oh, but let's enjoy the magic. It's the magic of the season. It's the magic of St. Nick. No, it's not. It's the lie. It's the spirit of Antichrist. That's what the spirit of the season is. You say, well, it's not really a bad lie. It's a harmless lie. All right, let's go to St. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and verse number 44. The Bible says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. An abode, that means you didn't stay, abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. 
for he is a liar and the father of it. In contrast, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. But if you go to John chapter 14, verse 6, we see, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Satan is a lie and the father of lies. Jesus is the truth. 